and uh, it will follow on the talk and it will repeat a lot of it. So my job has been made easier. I come from Nepean Hospital where we don't have cardiac surgery and don't have VA ECMO. So um, uh, we'll have to deal with that, but we'll touch up on some of that as well. And special thanks uh, with uh, helping prepare this talk to Stephen Huang, Sam Ward, Eugenia Cord, Yakuru Smith and I think from our cardiovascular ultrasound laboratory uh, that's attached to the ICU. So this is just the overview of the talk. Um, first we can try to see what is actually an adequate cardiac output that we should aim for and what we can live with. And then we try to determine uh, why it is actually not adequate and we can just go through the preload issues, the pump issues and the afterload issues and then we'll touch up on the management as well which has been already uh, mostly done. So what is an adequate cardiac output? Well, it's a bit like, you know, how, how low can you go? Uh, these days, very topical. Uh, and um, we can clinically assess that by looking at the patient, but often perioperative, that's very difficult. So if your patient has called cold climate skin, peripheral sinus, slow couple of refill, uh, then you think, okay, the cardiac output is not really adequate. Or mental state, patients under anesthetic or sedation, very difficult to assess. And low urine output takes a while. Um, and before it manifests as a low cardiac output. We can, what we can do is uh, measure lactate levels or uh, central venous blood gases, look at the central venous uh, saturation or the difference in the CO2 between the vein and the artery. But with lactate, um, we have to imagine that this is during exercise and this is um, where probably most of our patients are because they're under stress. You have not only release of lactate from the skin tissues, but you also have an uptake from uh, tissues such as liver, kidney, brain, and the heart. And if some of these organs don't function very well, that will elevate the level without actually any tissue hypoxia, as is manifested by this gentleman here who's holding his own blood gas, which has a lactate of 7.5. And the only reason he's got it as high is because he's on salbutamol infusion. And so I have to uh, realize that when you measure lactate, uh, you not necessarily measure just uh, mitochondrial dysfunction from tissue hypoxia, but you also measure the, the amount of adrenergic stress and aerobic glycolysis. Now, importantly, both adrenergic stress and aerobic glycolysis are present when there is some um, inadequate cardiac output, as well as tissue hypoxia. So it's kind of a good marker to see how much stress your patient is under, uh, but it may not necessarily be the reflection of the cardiac output itself. So how do we determine that the cardiac output is not adequate? Well, we can, as intensive as steel, job from the cardiologist and use the Swangans catheters. But we're a particular sort of breed of uh, doctors and we like to steal, use, abuse, and then abandon. So that's what we've essentially done with the Swangans catheters in, at least in non-cardiac surgical centers. And instead we use um, echo most of our needs, so stealing it again from the cardiologist. Um, but the reason for uh, us doing that is that because we realize that for managing patients with uh, different cardiac outputs, uh, we don't have much that we can use. Some of it is inotropes and basic presses, some of it is fluid. And that we really, uh, when we are using pressures measuring from the, the either central lines or the swung guns catheters, that the pressures that we measure were not, were not really helpful in deciding as who's going to respond to what treatment. As you can see, those people who respond don't behave much differently to those who don't respond in terms of their pressures in their pulmonary circulation. Uh, we can look at echoes, and sometimes that may be reasonably easy to look at and realize, okay, what do we need to do with this heart or that heart? And as uh, Greg was saying, our eyes are often trained very well um, to recognize this. But as long as, we, as long as we don't try to put a number on it, it may be working. But if we try to put a number on it again, it's not quite working. So if we're looking at right ventricle and diastolic volume index, for example, it doesn't help us distinguishing um, between those people who will respond to certain treatment or, or not. So maybe we could do post-mortem RV function analysis or heart function analysis, but that would probably be too late. Um, so this would probably happen. So if we think about what actually are the determinants of cardiac output, we need to look at all of those. 
So we need to look at the contractile preluvial heart rate and the diastology. Uh, we need to translate it into how the cardiac mechanics work and we need to take into account the fluid status and the vascular resistance of both pulmonary and systemic vasculature because um, they determine the venous return to a particular chamber. As intensive as you often deal with patients who may be ventilated or are not ventilated and may be on invasive or non-invasive ventilation and we have to realize that all of these will affect the preload of both the RV and LV as well as the afterload pulmonary vascular resistance and the uh, myocardial oxygen demand. So the net effect will be dependent on the underlying physiology. And this is an example of um, an echo of the same patient under different PEEP. And you can see the right ventricle there being reasonably happy with no PEEP, uh, starting to struggle a bit on uh, positive end expiratory pressure of 10, and certainly not coping with positive end expiratory pressure of 20. And this is a ventilated patient, of course, um, with a uh, lung disease. So often uh, the ventilation and the settings of the ventilation in perioperative period will have great influence on how well your uh, patients can affect in terms of uh, right ventricular function. The other things that happen if a patient's put in a catacomb bypass, uh, again, they have changes that are just related uh, to that rather than anything else and the mediators that are released uh, during the bypass and the drugs that are used and the chest conditions that are created by opening the chest and the pericardium. So you will have dilatation of the, of the particularly right-sided chamber and you will have some changes in the uh, venous flow both to the left and to the right heart. So because the way we like to think about it and I think the paradigm that is changing for intensivists certainly is trying to think of the, uh, of the preload not as the maximum amount of fluid that we need to give to patient to achieve the best cardiac output, but essentially how little can we actually get away with to, um, to maintain good cardiac filling and reasonable cardiac output. And so we'd like to more treat now the, our patients as in the, the normal patients who are preload dependent and who will have some fall in venous return with positive pressure ventilation, uh, although we don't want them to go into the no venous return and uh, falling right ventricle stroke volume, which will lead to low cardiac output. So in order to do that, we, we can use assessment of pressures. As I said, that's not very helpful. So we can use some dynamic indices uh, looking at the um, inferior vena cava or uh, um, hepatic venous flow and looking at the, whether there's both systolic and diastolic component of the hepatic venous flow um, that uh, suggests that the uh, capacity of the right ventricle to deal uh, with the uh, volume of venous blood that's going in there is uh, sufficient. And so we more and more often look at the, the venous flow uh, pattern in the, in, the, uh, in the liver, the hepatic vein, but we may also need to look a bit further and looking maybe at the uh, portal venous blood flow and that there are changes that actually are quite important and if it is important for the end organ dysfunction that we can see as part of the inadequate cardiac output and that may not be necessary because there's uh, not enough forward flow but because there's a lot of backward stasis uh, in, in the liver for example and the, the um, liver may fail as, may, as well as may the kidney because they're both inherently sensitive to increase uh, venous back pressures. So looking at the afterload pulmonary hypertension that was uh, spoken about by Paul, um, definition more than uh, 25 millimeters mercury mean pressure, often associated with those outcome in both cardiac and non-cardiac surgery and all these triggers such as stress and pain and the operative trauma certainly lead to uh, increased incidence of it and may further worsen any pre-existing right heart problem. And you've also seen this by, uh, from Paul in a different edition, uh, that if you have increased right ventricle afterload, you may get into the deadly spiral uh, of reduced uh, left ventricle preload and reduced cardiac output. And uh, the ventricle interdep interdependence and uh, pericardial pressures 
are, are quite important contributors to, to the right ventricle dysfunction once uh, the afterload is increased and the ventricle is not able to cope with uh, the increased uh, venous inflow. So how, how do we assess pulmonary pressures? Obviously all of you here know quite well that uh, tricuspid regurgitin jet is one way to do it, uh, but it may not be quite precise as long as we uh, go for the chin, it may be quite reasonable. Uh, we don't uh, measure the fluffy bits. Uh, another way is to measure pulmonary acceleration time, uh, but it may be more useful to actually look at the pattern and if you see this double-edged uh, pattern of um, pulmonary um, Doppler, uh, Doppler um, signal, that may signify that there is a significant amount of uh, increased uh, pulmonary artery pressures. So normal single, single envelope and pulmonary hypertension, you may have this uh, double peak pattern. <coughs> Again, as Greg was saying, uh, often what we what we need to know is look at the, the image, and once you see that the septum is bouncing or moving leftwards, you know that the, the patient is in trouble in terms of uh, uh, afterload. And this can be objectified by using a um, marker called the eccentricity index, Measured both, it can be measured both in diastole and systole. The diastolic signifying more volume overload, and the systolic uh, being more correlated to the uh, pressure overload of the right ventricle. And the correlation of these is, is actually quite good in terms of the relative increases in pulmonary vasculature. Okay, the other things uh, that ultrasound may be useful to is looking at actual some other causes than not necessarily the pulmonary vasculature itself and causes of pulmonary hypertension. So if you have uh, this being a lung ultrasound showing uh, B lines, which means that this patient has got pulmonary edema, that may be one of the reasons, uh, may be the left ventricle failure. There may be collapse of a disputum plaque leading to consolidation of, um, of the lung beyond the, the, um, the collapse. There may be diaphragm paralysis post-surgery uh, with associated effusion and, um, and developing pneumonia. And there may be the consequence of increased right ventricle pressure and right ventricle failure, which is uh, the development of uh, gut ischemia from venous stasis. And this is a picture of an eyeless uh, of a um, dying bowel, which is what often kills these patients. So again, therapy was touched upon, so right ventricle afterload reduction, and you can use intravenous or inhaled uh, agents in different combinations, and um, the um, cardiac surgical centers will have much more experience with that uh, than we do. Uh, we essentially are using only nitric oxide uh, inhaled and uh, inotropes intravenously. So looking at the contractility of the ventricle, as was already mentioned several times, this is a complex structure, very difficult to assess. And again, eyeballing uh, might be sometimes what's required to actually look at the ventricle and see whether the ventricle is performing well uh, or not performing well, but it's very difficult to quantify it. Um, and that's because right ventricle likes to transmit fibers, this predominant longitudinal muscle fibers, and there's a little uh, bellows motion inwards. And that's, this is related to the fact where in embryology um, the heart is made into a sort of a, a towel that's wrapped uh, together and the right ventricle sort of comes in the end and it's wrapping itself around the, the left ventricle. Um, so how do we assess systolic function? We can look at all these uh, measures, the uh, TAPC, TDI of the, of the tricuspid annulus, um, the velocity integral in the, in the right ventricle outflow tract, the myocardial performance index fraction area change, and right ventricle free wall strain. So um, you all, I'm sure, are familiar with all these. Um, the right ventricle free wall strain essentially is able to measure the displacement of the myocardium towards the apex. And because there's longitudinal fibers, there's, there's big hope that this may um, be a good marker of right ventricle systolic dysfunction. But there's a caveat that this is not only metrics of the ventricle contractility, but they also reflect ventricle arterial coupling. In other words, how effective the ventricle is in getting the blood from the IVC into the right atrium and into the right ventricle. So it is important 
uh, to know what you're actually measuring uh, in order to not make mistakes, such some some people may do when they're looking at growth rather than facts. Anyway, so longitudinal strain after catapulmonary bypass can be done. Again, you can see that bypass itself can induce significant changes in the strain. In other words, reduce uh, the displacement of the myocardial fibers themselves, um, and that may lead to reduced function or as, a, as an objective way, somewhat objective way to, to measure um, cardiac contractility. In terms of right ventricle uh, management of failing right heart, uh, it's a, important looking for causes. So exclude the common ones that occur in cardiac surgery, embolism, obstruction of the IR flow tract, ischemia, embolism, uh, thromboembolism, fluid overload, which is very uh, probably uh, common and uh, any uh, lung pathology that can be easily corrected. Uh, again, as Paul already alluded to, the maintenance of mean arterial pressure in the systemic circulation is critical, as is the maintenance of sinus rhythm and, and avoiding uh, things that can be easily avoided but that increase right ventricle afterload. Uh, selecting the uh, inotropic agents that uh, you're most familiar with uh, perhaps levosomin might be one of those drugs that will eventually prove to be beneficial in this situation. Um, and um, early revascularization in those who have ongoing ischemia and use inhaled agents were indicated. This is just looking at some of the what inotropes and vasopressors uh, can be used. And as you can see, cardiac surgery, the overall effect of using inotropes and vasopressors is actually positive, unlike what happens in heart failure, uh, sort of chronic heart failure treatment or acute decompensation of chronic heart failure. Inotropes uh, or vasopressors are not very good drugs for you, whereas in cardiac surgery, uh, it seems that there's, a, uh, there's a, a benefit of using these drugs to support the, the right heart, at least in the short term. And it doesn't really matter which, um, which drugs you use, perhaps some, some uh, beneficial effect about the others with uh, levisimendum and use in that situation. And whether that's because it may lead to reduced pulmonary vascular resistance uh, is a possibility. Other important feature of managing the right heart in, uh, in critically ill and post-cardiac surgery is fluid management. And again, looking at the venous congestion and the, the portal congestion and, uh, and the increased venous back pressure in the renal vein, they can lead to liver, dis lead to liver dysfunction and cardiorenal syndrome and gut ischemia. Um, Therefore, maintaining relatively aggressive diuresis and even using hemofiltration may sometimes be needed to reduce the, the preload for the right ventricle to allow it to, to um, be less distended and more efficient. And uh, strategies during surgery that aim to reduce the right ventricle distension uh, may improve the efficiency. And as is alluded this morning as well, uh, decision about the tricuspid valve annual plasty or any uh, correction of tricuspid valve abnormality may be, may be useful to these patients. But there's a hope. Uh, so if you have an acutely deteriorating right heart, there's uh, perhaps a reasonable potential for recovery in the acute settings. And uh, recent advances also seen that there are some temporary devices such as the uh, venoarterial arterial ECMO. Uh, and the decision then when the right ventricle is not responding to the simple measures uh, is to institute that support uh, without delay. And the support has been described as using something called Centromac, which I have no experience in using, never seen it, but it was reported that the survivors were quite reasonably by Bauma et al. And there are other minimally invasive right ventricle support systems that are being developed, such as the Implarite and Tandem Heart right ventricle support devices. So with that, I'd like to thank you.